heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde of Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. Ed Ludlow, he's on assignment in Sun Valley. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, Microsoft wins U.S. court approval to move forward with its $69 billion deal for Activision Blizzard. We'll discuss the next steps after the FTC faces a loss in blocking the biggest ever gaming deal. Plus, Amazon Prime Day kicks off. Shoppers expected to spend upwards of $13 billion. We'll break down what to expect from the e-commerce giant. And we go live to Ed Ludlow in Sun Valley, Idaho. Billionaires also descend on the mountains for their annual gathering. We'll break down what to expect as artificial intelligence, the future of streaming, and of course, those massive gaming deals dominate the conversation. But first, let's check in on the markets. And I'm very pleased to say that today we've got Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle helping. Wonderful to be here with you, Caroline. And we do have the bulls, the stock bulls, coming through just a little bit. Because earlier we were looking at the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, the Dow. The major index is fluctuating. Now we're looking at the gain. We're looking at gains. The S&P 500 up about half a percent. The tech-heavy NASDAQ up four-tenths of one percent. And it has a lot to do with that Microsoft Activision deal. Because earlier today, Microsoft had been down about nine percent, or excuse me, nine-tenths of one percent after dropping one and a half to two percent yesterday on the news that the NASDAQ 100 is going to be doing a special rebalancing to reduce some of those big tech weightings. But on the news that uh, that deal can go through court approval, uh, that the FTC cannot block that merger between Microsoft and Activision, we have Microsoft uh, climbing higher. That seems to be helping out Apple, which is now only down nine tenths of one percent, or excuse me, two tenths of one percent. I'm having some issues here with numbers. Uh, and then Amazon Prime Day has started, two days, of course, uh, up 1.4 percent. But Caroline, if we put this into the bigger context over the last month, we have the NASDAQ 100 and the NICE FANG index, all those mega cap tech right now called the Magnificent Seven, basically stuck in a range. So that tells you investors are waiting on information. CPI tomorrow, will it come in hot or as expected? We have bank earnings kicking off later this uh, week, then tech earnings, the Fed. So again, lots of information. This range right now presents a little bit bearishly, so it may suggest that investors will push big tech stocks back down into the range. We don't know that. But finally, let's take a look at one stock that is certainly popping, and that is Activision. And at this point, we also have Microsoft higher. So Activision absolutely soaring up 11% on this news that this deal can go through. Plus, right before I came on air, there was a redhead talking about the UK, that Microsoft and CMA and the agency, the regulating agency in the UK, had asked for a pause in the litigation. That might be a good sign. And an interesting point on Activision, Caroline, is this deal, as you you know, $69 billion record. It was first proposed in January of 2022. So it's taken some time. That stock initially on that news popping about 39%. Well, it's right around there now. Investors really think this is going to get done. They certainly do by the reaction in the stock price. Abigail, brilliant. Thank you very much for setting us up. Let's dig in on the minutiae to do with Microsoft's court win here in the U.S. We've got Bloomberg's Malati Nayak with us, who's covering this trial day in, day out for us. And Malati, before I start asking you about the UK, just dwell on what's happening in the United States right now, because it felt like you'd already called it that the judge seemed to be erring towards Microsoft and Activision. That's right. You know, we did see in the last round of questioning by the judge that she was really uh, asking the FTC for a lot of evidence that uh, they were unable to sort of come up with in court. So today we have a ruling where the judge has denied a preliminary injunction, which is basically a request by the agency to block the deal while the while it's longer, uh, you know, challenge to the deal is pending. But as we've seen, uh, you know, the, uh, something similar happened with Meta and uh, Meta's acquisition of uh, within, and that deal was also sort of a loss uh, for the FTC at this stage, and the FTC backed out. So it's possible that, you know, the FTC will back out because there is an administrative uh, uh, sort of a, a court case that the, the FTC still has pending against Microsoft, a sort of internal court case uh, that's, that's uh, you know, going to happen in the next couple of weeks. Okay, so it's not a foregone conclusion, but we anticipate, and certainly the market anticipates, that it's more likely to get done. Ultimately, how much of a knock is this to the FTC? As you say, they, they seem to be trying to take on really tough cases here. 
Yeah, you know, this has been a big test for the FTC's ability, especially when it comes to challenging big tech M&A deals. They really needed this win, uh, you know, especially after what happened. This is coming, you know, just very close in the, you know, on the heels of what happened with uh, FTC and, and uh, F, uh, FTC's challenge to uh, Meta and Within. So it just seems like even in speaking with uh, a lot of folks who were in court, the, you know, merger arbitrages, they were very, very closely watching this case because I think they were interested in seeing where the FTC might go moving forward, you know, is the FTC actually bringing some cases which uh, are le leading to a, a, this sort of losing streak? Do they have to sort of think perhaps carefully about battles that they want to sort of uh, uh, sort of enter and sort of uh, win? So we'll have to see what happens mm. next in terms of FTC moving forward with other deals. But we've seen already, you know, uh, 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 Chairman Lena Khan, she's just been uh, one of the most aggressive trespassers we've seen in the U.S. in decades. So we'll have to see what the FTC decides to do next after this particular ruling. I'm sure Amazon is keeping a close eye as well. Alati yeah. Nayak, thank you so much for bringing us the expertise. Let's just get the Microsoft angle and indeed the international angle next. The Bloomberg's Dina Bass. And Dina, I'm sure this is going to be joyous for Satya Nadella and indeed Bobby Kotick. They're both going to be over there in Sun Valley. But there are still some stumbling blocks. What do you make of the headline around Microsoft and Activision and the UK CMA, the Competition Markets Authority, also perhaps pausing their litigation? Yeah, all eyes are on the CMA right now. Uh, the, the minute that this ruling came out this morning, everybody's attention turned away from that courtroom in California and across the pond to the UK, uh, which is the remaining stumbling block for this deal. Now, the CMA has just, uh, in the last couple of minutes, said that they are willing to consider any proposals for Microsoft to restructure the transaction in, in a manner that would address their concerns. And as a result, they and Microsoft and Activision have asked uh, the court in the UK to pause uh, the litigation so that they can focus on, on proposals. You know, Microsoft uh, has issued a statement as well saying that they, they still don't agree with the CMA's objections, but they are interested in trying to find a way to resolve them. To uh, the FTC's perspective, have they kind of won a little bit or indeed have competition authorities at least gleaned some sort of changes to the ultimate deal to ensure that there might be competition is this almost a win-win on every side dina so i don't know that the ftc will see it that way we'd have to ask them but the, the judge actually made that point in court at one point saying that you know the fact that uh, microsoft had signed some of these agreements to put call of duty on other other platforms and was willing to sign on with sony, with sony met that the ftc on some level had already won and you know when you look through her ruling that uh, was one of the reasons that she found the FTC's case was not persuasive. Um, you know, was that Microsoft had, from the minute the deal was announced, made it made it clear that they wanted to, uh, you know, to put it on other platforms. She made similar arguments on uh, some of the arguments that the FTC was making on uh, lack of, uh, you know, worsening the competitive picture in cloud gaming um, as well as gaming subscriptions. That, you know, in those areas, she seemed to find some of Microsoft's arguments m more persuasive than the FTC's. How big a relief is this for Brad Smith and for Satya now? Well, again, they still have to get through the CMA. You, you have to realize that if the judge had ruled the opposite way, if she had issued a preliminary injunction, the deal was all but dead. Bobby Kotick, while on the stand, said that, uh, you know, if there was a preliminary injunction issued, his board was likely to back away from the deal. Microsoft made a similar point in their preliminary filings in, in the case. There, there was really not a, a way forward for this deal if the judge had issued a preliminary injunction. They still have to get through the, uh, the UK situation. As you say, all eyes on the UK now and the CMA. Dina Bass, brilliant to have you on. Thank you so much with the latest on Microsoft's perspective to that ruling. Meanwhile, coming up, Amazon Prime Day kicks off. And shoppers prepared to spend millions will get inside the head of Amazon. With John Felton, I'm pleased to say, Amazon's Senior Vice President of Worldwide Operations. Meanwhile, look, there are other deals that still are being assessed by certain authorities. And VMware is currently jumping more than 5.5%, as you can see. Session highs on an FT report that the EU is set to clear its own $69 billion acquisition by Broadcom. So, all eyes on these competition authorities at the moment. From New York, this is Bloomberg.
you noticed, but Amazon Prime Day is underway. Shoppers estimated to eclipse last year's spend of $12 billion worldwide. For more on what we can expect, let's bring in Poonam Goyal from Bloomberg Intelligence right here in New York. So pleased to have you, Poonam. Thank you. Are we expecting consumers to be enticed as much as previous years? Is this going to be the biggest ever? It should be the biggest ever. It always is. Um, yeah, consumers are focused on value, right? So Prime Day just brings ba value back up front in consumers' mind. There are deals. There have been deals all year. But I can tell you, just from what I've been seeing all day, is that the deals are bigger than they have been all year. They're rolling out lightning deals. Some things are already sold out. So I think consumers will just be watching and seeing. A lot of uh, consumers are saying that they have a list going into Prime Day. So clearly budget focused. And then there are many, 50% according to our survey, that will just buy as they see deals. Mm -hmm. OK, so looking for value. What about sort of the global perspective of this as well? How does the Prime Day offering vary? I'm looking at a US offering. What does it look like in the UK and Europe? Well, remember, Prime Day, if you think about like just Prime members, right, 160 million of the 200 plus million members are in the U.S. So it is definitely largely a U.S. event, but it is also international. And everywhere across the world, I think everyone is crunched for cash right now. Interest rates are higher. There are macroeconomic tensions, geopolitical tensions around the world. So the value proposition that Amazon offers on Prime Day will also be sought after abroad as well as here. And just remind us how important it is to the overall company and indeed therefore the investor because what's interesting in the last few years, you've actually seen a bit of a sell-off, a sort of a fade into Prime Day from a stock perspective. At least. Prime Day is important. It's 8% of the quarter sales in just two days alone. So clearly still very important for Amazon, but also it keeps Amazon top of mind, right? So as you think about consumers shopping for the summer, for back to school, and even the holidays, you know, we're hearing people are shopping for the holidays as early as right now. So it just keeps them relevant. It keeps them top of mind. It shows that we have everything here and you can buy it. But Amazon's not the only one one offering deals today and tomorrow. We've seen Target Circle Week. We've seen Walmart, you know, doing its plus week. So there's a lot going on outside too. Ah, oh, there's always a competition. Poonam Goyal, thank you so much for breaking it down from Bloomberg Intelligence. And look, we can go straight to the horse's mouth right now. I'm very pleased to welcome John Felton, Amazon Senior Vice President of Worldwide Operations, who's probably having a pretty busy day, John. So we're appreciative of you fitting us in. And I mean, you have caused a sensation. Other companies do try to copy you on the same day at the same sort of time. How do you set yourselves apart and keep people wanting to come back? Yeah, it, it's Christmas in July, and it's one of our favorite times of year. We're now heading into our ninth Prime Day, uh, and so really excited about it. It has just become kind of its own event, uh, which we love. This year, I do expect to be bigger than ever. We've got more deals than ever before. Uh, we've got millions and millions of deals. They're dropping every 30 minutes. Uh, and so we're really excited about what we're seeing so far. Uh, and the things I'm thinking about, it's like we get 50% off the top selling toys, 50% off the top selling TVs, up to 75% off Amazon devices. Uh, there really is a deal for everybody out there. I've even got friends who they, they use Prime Day to kind of shop for their everyday essentials of kind of getting the toothpaste, getting the shampoo. Uh, and so it's a really big day. We're excited to kind of thank Prime members for their loyalty. And the best way we know how to do that is, is give them value and give them savings. I One stat that I still, still think is amazing is Last year, uh, Prime members saved $1.7 billion, and we're hoping to eclipse that this year. And make it more personal. How are you using technology in and of itself to try and make sure that I feel targeted in the right way? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, what, a lot of our AI technology is really focused on the personalization, and you'll even see it see it this year uh, differently. Kind of when you look at the website for yourself, it's different than than, than looking at it for your friends. We are working uh, kind of day and night to keep improving the personalization, uh, building kind of an AI technology to really help that. So we give you a really customized experience, so you can find the deals that work for you. And also using Alexa, right? Not only are you able to sort of buy the latest Alexa, yeah. but you can use it to shop too. Yeah, there's some great new Alexa features we have now is anything that's in your kind of your shopping cart right now, anything on your wish list, anything on save for later, if it goes on deal, Alexa will announce it to you and let you know, hey, this just went on a great deal. Do you want to buy it? And so helping customers find a deal that's right for them, helping what they're most excited for is really what Prime Day is all about. Of course, we can see people behind you busily at work. How much of a logistical feat is that? How much work do you have to put in? How ensuring are you that you're sort of as close to the customer as you can be? Yeah, that's it. That's what we, we, we planned for months for Prime Day. Uh, and I've got, I'm here in uh, Melville, New York, in a sub same day building, uh, and they're just excited. The employees here are excited. They, they love Prime Day as much as Prime members do. Uh, and this, you can feel the excitement, you can feel the buzz in here, uh, and everyone's just excited to go to deliver all the gifts we have. What about the robots? The robots are also behind me. Uh, <laughs> there's now 750,000 of them 
uh, running around. So you can kind of see the, the shelf kind of comes to the employee right now. And so that's what we, we felt kind of really good about kind of our, our robotic technology. It's how do we help our employees kind of do their jobs better? How do we do, help them do it safer? How do we help them do it more productively? And how do they kind of really enjoy the collaborative uh, experience with the robots? Of course, with great success comes great responsibility. And there has been that focus on ensuring that the workforce labor is treated right. There's also, it seems to be a focus on well, that you're supporting small business here. Just tell us as to why you're looking at that and why perhaps you don't want to seem like you're eating everyone's lunch. Yeah, that's exactly right. It, small business is incredibly important. It's been powering Amazon for years. 60% uh, of everything we sell is from small businesses. Uh, and there's a lot of new features that we have on the website this year. Uh, uh, we recently at launched the ability to kind of filter your search results by small business results. I was actually playing around with this this morning and we're doing hot sauce and I was able to find kind of hot sauce uh, uh, vendors, small businesses that are supporting in, in Long Island, uh, where I'm at right now. And so really kind of helping small businesses be successful. Small businesses are kind of a lot of the drivers of the growth. They're getting more deals than ever this prime day. And so we're really excited about how do we support them. Does the consumer ultimately not just talk the talk, but walk the walk on that? Do they really care about small businesses? Do they really care about the fact that you're perhaps closer to them, so less of an environmental perspective? What do you see from the consumer? That's what we're seeing, is, is consumers are having a great prime day today. I, one of the things I've been kind of happy with is I do think kind of the, the U.S. consumer, even the global consumer, uh, they've got high, they're dealing with high inflation, high interest rates, but they've been surprisingly resilient. They continue to kind of come back, but they are looking for value. And that's what Prime Day is about. How do we kind of bring them, bring them as much value? Uh, and this idea of kind of we can save them billions of dollars on Prime Day uh, is, is just a tremendous value we're able to offer customers. And of course, the reason they want value is because the economy is in a much tougher position. And Amazon itself has been having to ensure that it's focused much more on costs, having to make tough choices, laying off people. I'm interested as to really how optimistic you are going past Prime Day that the consumer is there to support your business. I'm optimistic. I still have a lot of optimism in the U.S. economy and the U.S. consumer. Uh, they continue to show up. I agree. They are, they're, uh, they're looking for value, and we need to make sure we're able to kind of be best on price, best on speed. Uh, I'm in a sub-same-day building, so th these items here are being able to delivered in four or five hours. So to be able to get your prime day order on the same day within four hours is, a, is an amazing feat. This business itself, the sub-day, same-day business, grew over 50% in the first quarter. Uh, and so it's really resonating with consumers that they're looking for speed and convenience uh, and price. John Felton, busy day. We'll let you get back to it. Amazon SVP for Worldwide Operations. We thank you for your time. Meanwhile, coming out, we, of course, have got so much to enjoy in the world of Sun Valley. I know Jeff Bezos is going to be there, Ed. Yeah, and the Activision Microsoft deal is just one that we're watching in the world of tech, media and telecoms here at the summer camp for billionaires. It's back. This is Bloomberg Technology. Time now for Talking Tech. First up, Tata is closing in on a deal to become the first Indian iPhone maker. Now, the company is set to buy an Apple suppliers factory as soon as August in an effort to increase the plant's employment and expand output, according to Bloomberg reporting. Meanwhile, Uber, seeing its biggest ever executive departure since going public, Chief Financial Officer Nelson Chai is planning to leave the ride-hailing giant. Chai informed CEO Dara Khosrowshahi of his intentions to move on, though a decision on timing hasn't yet been made. Chai was tapped by Khosrowshahi in 2018 to lead the listing. Plus, an artificial intelligence researcher who co-authored one of Google's most influential papers is leaving the company to launch a startup. Employee who helped write the pioneering AI paper, Attention is All You Need, confirmed to Bloomberg that he will depart Google Japan later this month. Some of the biggest names, meanwhile, in technology, media, and business, well, guess where they are? the Idaho Mountains for the Allen & Co. Sun Valley Conference. Also dubbed, look, the Summer Camp of Billionaires, the annual summit features a series of big picture panels, many of which will focus on the rise of artificial intelligence, of course. Also, the future of streaming and, well, M&A as it stands. All right, Ludlow, you're on site, you're in Sun Valley, Idaho, and boy, they're all going to be talking about that $69 billion deal, right? Yeah. Yeah, we have news. It will be front and center. You know, you were talking earlier in Bloomberg Technology with Dina Bass. Imagine if the decision had gone the other way. But Bobby Kotick is here this week in Sun Valley. I understand that Satya Nadella will be here too. 
And what a blow this is to the FTC and CMA. When I touched down last night, in between the mountains, the sun setting on the beautiful landscape. I was thinking about Lena Khan and the FTC because actually this year there's a real emphasis on, on the history of Sun Valley, which is telecoms, technology and media, or TMT, and deals. And last year there was only one story, Elon Musk's purchase of Twitter, but, but all the breaking news of this morning puts the, the landscape for deals in this sector uh, front and centre for all the attendees. We might see some more activity now. Yeah, isn't it? It's not the only $69 billion deal even. I mean, the fact that Broadcom looks right. like it might get VMware, according to the FT. So some really big, major chip deals and, and indeed, as we've seen, gaming deals. But talk to us about the world of streaming and, and indeed, well, content, really. Yeah. We're potentially seeing art mimic life a little bit with Succession. I love that, Arc Mimicking Life. You know, it, the streaming story is also one of all of the names involved. You know, the top ranks of Netflix will be here. Uh, David Zaslav from Warner Brothers Discovery. And I understand that in the last couple of minutes, Bob Iger has just walked through the front door of Sun Valley. It's interesting, if there's a deal that we pick out, it might be Hulu. Because remember that Comcast mm. retains a third of Hulu with an option to enforce Disney to buy out its stake. My understanding is that Brian Roberts Comcast isn't here this week, but it's one that everyone's watching because the, the, the current valuation is like $27 billion. I know that Disney don't think it should be that much if they were to buy out the remaining stake. And then Iger, what's his future? I remember a year ago when I was here, he arrived with Bob Chapek. He just retired. Chapek had taken the reins. And how long did that last? Not long at all. And it was already awkward then. He was already under pressure because Disney was not having a great time this time a year ago. Yeah, and now we're all eyeing as to who he's come with now from, you know, those heading up the TV part of Disney, those heading up all well, the parks as well. And I'm interested in not only sort of some of the succession planning and some of the individuals, but individuals of old. What's so interesting, you mentioned we were all talking Elon Musk this time last year and that it's deal, his deal for Twitter. Yes. Now we're thinking about the competition for Twitter. Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah, will he be the man of the moment? Um, you know, you and I have talked every day about threads, every milestone, 100 million on the show 24 hours ago. I remember 2021, the New York Times published that big story about how Mark Zuckerberg's relationship with Sheryl Sandberg had deteriorated because of how she had handled uh, Facebook, now Meta's uh, relationship with Washington, D.C. And I remember being there and guess who walked past smiling mm -hmm. ear to ear? Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg, very different vibe now. He could be the main man everyone wants to talk to. I can imagine. And I'm sure you're going to be giving us live updates on threads and Twitter and whatever other social media form you're going to be taking. Ed Ludlow, live from Sun Valley, Idaho. Meanwhile, coming up, look, Wall Street institutions are hopping into the crypto ETF bandwagon. We'll discuss that next with Ava Labs president. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. Let's get you a check on the markets halfway through this trading day. And look, we're in kind of wait and see mode, aren't we? We're up about a tenth of percent on the Nasdaq as we all eye the macro picture of CPI tomorrow, the inflation print. Will we see still that July Fed rate hike baked in? And then we start to question where September goes. But for now, MSCI or Country World Index has been on a relative upswing today, up six tenths of a percent. Europe did well. We're up more than a percentage point on the CAC, for example. So a little bit more risk appetite over in Europe and even Asia trading to the higher side. Interesting a little bit of sell-off in the bond market, so that's still showing that maybe you're not seeking that sort of safety on the day after yields came down yesterday. We're seeing 4.88 is where we trade on the two-year, that more sensitive to rate hikes. Let's move it on and have a little look in the world of individual movers. Amazon, it is all eyes on Prime Day. We're up more than a percentage point. Microsoft, interestingly, off by four tenths percent. But why? Because look, they might well be putting that $69 billion to work for that deal for Activision Blizzard, which is soaring 11 percent as the U.S. court seems to give blessing, not holding up the overall culmination of that deal that's meant to, of course, be finalized come July the 18th. We all eye now the UK legislatures and CMA, the Competition Market Authority there, as to whether they too will see some changes being done overall by Microsoft and think that competition is going to be preserved by the deal. Now, let's get on to the individual intricacies of another asset type. Crypto. Now, we know that all regulators are denying that particular space, particularly here in the United States. And, well, look at the SEC in particular. Its power over crypto just seems to be growing. SEC Chair Gary Gensler 
filling the crypto regulatory void at the moment. We want to dig into that and some of the push from big institutions to still want to get in on the space. Avalab's president, John Wu, joins us, I'm pleased to say, along with our very own Shanali Basak, crypto expert in residence. And let's start with you, John, a little bit as to how the mood feels right now, because last time we've come on, you know, peak bank crisis, peak worries and um, trials and tribulations of crypto, we can seem to be in a holding pattern right now. Well, I think the mood for uh, practitioners like ourselves who are operating the space is obviously better. Ever since, ever since uh, frankly, Larry Fink, BlackRock, Fidelity, and all these big players decided to refile for their ETFs, mm. it's a big show of confidence that not only do they think their individual users, we're talking about $9 trillion of assets at BlackRock, $5 trillion at Fidelity, are interested in the space, but I have a deep suspicion that Larry Fink realizes now, based on his comments, that there is real use case and it's useful to tokenize financial assets, to streamline operations. He was as so well. skeptical. He was so skeptical. Read his quotes from 17, 18 versus 22, 23. Complete about face. And that's what makes me very excited. We if, need new leaders into the space. But if you have a crypto industry that was supposed to be separate from Wall Street and you have a Wall Street giant stepping into the crypto industry, why embrace it if you're kind of a crypto native here? If you believe that there should be another system, then what is the point of BlackRock getting in? I think there will be two worlds. There will be the white glove service that a BlackRock provides, low fees, uh, custody, et cetera, et cetera. And then there are the deeper intricacies where only a native crypto firm like Ava Labs really, really understands. All the stuff that Larry Fink is talking about, Ava Labs already provides in what we call a sub-network, which is a blockchain as a service with a software development kit that has all the features for compliance and use cases. In fact, we've already partnered with Wisdom Tree, with Wellington and t Row doing similar things. So I'm excited because it lends more credibility to space. What about Coinbase? Let's talk about it for a second because BlackRock chose a crypto firm, Coinbase, to deal with its custody of Bitcoin. On the same time, there's a lot of questions about fee compression when it comes to the Bitcoin space. How do you kind of net out the effect here for a firm like Coinbase as more ETFs get in? Yeah, absolutely. There's definitely going to be fee compression on the retail side. On the institutional side, Coinbase is making huge strides. In fact, I think five of the, all five of the top uh, ETF filers, BlackRock as well as um, CBOE, are using Coinbase as a surveillance partner. Now, if these mega traditional financial institutions trust Coinbase, maybe the agencies will have to also reevaluate if they trust them as well. Chinali, I mean, with your expertise, the way you're following it at the moment, what about the regulatory overhang? Because that's all we've been talking about for the first few months. And then now with BlackRock and with big, these big institutions, what about SEC? What about CFTC? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's been this big expectation that the SEC will come in and just approve these ETFs. But we've seen many years go by without that happening. At the same time here, I mean, I'm wondering, you know, how hesitant are Wall Street firms to get in? And an issue we've been talking about on the sidelines here is not just the ETF world, but also just the plain old liquidity you're seeing in boring old Bitcoin markets. We have gone nowhere, guys. For three mm -hmm. weeks, it's been up against that, 30,000. Trading. That's a great point. If you look at the volumes, whether it be on Coinbase or the overall averages uh, in the indices, volume is still coming down even though prices are going up. And that's what I've been talking about for a long time. The market structure is still kind of broken. All the leveraged players in the past, whether that be Celsius, BlockFi, Genesis, they're not in there to provide leverage so people can trade more. It's the same people trading, creating price movement, but the volumes are still down and going down. But is a lack of leverage ultimately a better, more healthy thing? And to that point, does that then move us outside of the world of just talking about Bitcoin into, well, some of the altcoins and your own ecosystem a little bit? Yes more? and no. Leverage has been part of every financial ecosystem, mm -hmm. whether it's mortgaging for a house or whether it is in other financial markets. Um, in fact, if you don't have leverage, you don't have velocity of money and you don't have growth. So leverage is a healthy maintaining and maintaining a healthy leverage is important for any ecosystem. And John, give us a sense of like globally where we sit right now, because the talk on this show has been a lot about, well, we're losing our talent from the US. They're all going to the Middle East. We're interesting news out of BitOasis and, and the regulatory oversight there today. But people are looking at other places to build their companies, their startups. But where are volumes coming from internationally? Because it all used to be based on China, really. Great question. I mean, from my seat as an operator, I see far more business development activity in Asia as well as in Europe. 
Although the U.S. financial services firm have taken a step back, waiting for the compliance and regulation to play out, the amount of deals we're working on at Alva Labs in Asia, as well as in Europe, have only increased. So they see the usefulness of the blockchain technology, and they're engaged. U.S., hopefully with these new leaders, will start that process as well. You know, it's interesting to see this international engagement, but at the same time, wouldn't you still see Bitcoin prices move higher if there was that much more engagement? At this point, do you see more risk to the upside or the downside when it comes to Bitcoin? No one could predict the short, short term. It's a 40, 45 percent vol product, so who knows? But I see in the medium and long term upsides where you want to be. Um, you, have, you have the halvening coming next year. Historically, that means it goes higher into it. And also, if you look at the uh, curves in the financial markets for the futures contracts for Bitcoin, no one's giving it price appreciation. So I think you can look at like the options market. A 25 delta call on Bitcoin is priced almost the same as a, for three months. It's almost the same as a 25 delta call six months out on Bitcoin. And for a 45 to 50 vol product, that's really not much contango. It's kind of weird. So no one's giving it credit. And usually you take the opposite side of uh, where people are standing. Oh, John, technical analysis, music to our ears. Talk the, a little bit about being anything other than basically speculative asset class like even in the world of nfts we have still seen underlying work being done there interesting moves with mischief interesting moves yep. with Louis Vuitton, interesting moves with collectibles but the price points aren't shifting particularly and i'm interested in ultimately whether people see this as anything other at the moment than a speculative asset class we see it differently the work we we're doing with nfts we're working with like sk which is a large conglomerate in korea mm. they have probably one of the largest loyalty programs in the world 24 25 million south koreans are in this 90,000 unique merchants so basically they're going to put that loyalty program on a blockchain when you have that many participants and you need to move information of value at the same time you want to do it on a blockchain that's how we're exploring with nfts through loyalty programs there are other companies even the u.s work brand companies working with NFTs to create more engagement. There's a use case for NFTs, not just pure digital collectibles. Great to have some time with you always. Ava Labs, President John Wu, Bloomberg Shanali Basak in the house, so pleased to have her with me as well. And look, it's a crypto kind of a day. Stick with Bloomberg Crypto. It's at 1 p.m. Eastern at 10 a.m. Pacific. Meanwhile, coming up, well, guess what the other flavor of the month, of course, is and the year. State of AI. We're going to talk about that as well as cybersecurity venture investing. And Ruke Salem is going to be with us, partner at Bain Capital Ventures. That's next. This is Bloomberg. today's VC Spotlight. And we're very pleased to welcome to the show Bain Capital Ventures partner, Enrique Salem, who focuses on, well, all stages in investing, particularly in infrastructure software and cybersecurity over at Bain. Let's also bring in Bloomberg investing reporter, Hema Palmer, who's helped bring about this interview, and we really appreciate it. So, Enrique, Bain Capital, you've been there, what, since 2014? You were leading Symantec, which eventually, of course, was bought by Broadcom and, and has changed its name. But as a leader and now as an investor, how much has the game sort of been reorientated to, uh, towards artificial intelligence for 2023? Yeah, if, if you look at the, the opportunities right now, we're definitely seeing that, you know, generative AI specifically, which is really the thing that is driving a lot of meaningful change. If, if you take a look at what it's going to disrupt, uh, think about how software is being written. Today, software developers have to sit down and write each line of code. In the future and near term, we expect that probably, you know, 40% of what a developer has done can be handled through AI. And we, we think that's not a fad. That is a, a meaningful change. And that's just one example of what we think is going to be really meaningful as we take advantage of this new major trend. And speaking about you know, disruption and AI, talk to us a bit about what you think the disruption could mean when it comes to phishing and hacking and cybersecurity. What influence does what we're seeing in AI now mean for that universe? Well, the, the thing that is going on is using new generative AI technologies, what an attacker can do is be significantly more targeted. So what does that mean? They can quickly generate an email message, a phishing attack, that will be very specific to you, to what you do, things they know about you that before they wouldn't have been able to do as effectively. And so what does that mean? That means it's more likely 
that somebody will respond. And if they respond, now the attacker is inside the network. And so we just think that the sophistication from the attacker's perspective will significantly increase. And you spoke about the opportunity set with AI. How would you look at the risks? You just mentioned one. Um, are there certain areas of AI and venture or later stage investing that you're avoiding given some of the concerns that we're seeing right now? Well, I th you know, when you look at the, the total landscape, there, there's always things that you want to be careful in. And, you know, one of the areas that a lot of us have thought about, and you just had a discussion on, on what's happening with what we'll call centralized finance. We're, we're big believers in decentralized finance, mm -hmm. uh, and we, we think that that, that is going to be uh, a big opportunity going forward. But I would say broadly, uh, we're bullish on what's happening in AI. We're bullish on what's happening in, in cyber. Decentralized finance, what areas? I mean, are you still running checks when it's related to crypto? Yeah, so we, we raised a, a fund last year, and so we continue to invest in the companies that are working on new blockchain technologies. And so we've got investments in companies like Scroll, Celestia, and, and we think there's still real opportunity ahead. Um, you know, the, the question really is, there's cycles, and mm -hmm. we saw some of the, uh, you know, excesses of, of 21. We think we're in a much healthier environment now. This is more normal, and we even shouldn't lose that. Even for AI that. startups, even for valuations there. I, you know, I think you're you're seeing that the best founders have moved into what's happening in the generative AI space, and so what that begins to do is they can command premium valuations, and so definitely uh, we're seeing some overheated uh, prices, but but we think that's driven by what the opportunity set is, which we think is. Incredible. You know, we've made an investment, for example, in a company called uh, Unstructured. And if you think about what they do is they're taking all your corporate data and allowing you to train a model on your own specific data. And so we think companies like Unstructured, companies like Contextual, which are solving real problems around hallucination, because one of the problems with generative AI that I think we've all experienced is that sometimes you'll ask a question or you'll ask for some information and it'll give you some amount of randomness. And what companies like Contextual that we've invested in are really trying to do is eliminate that hallucination. Speaking about valuations, how do you see the runway ahead when it comes to the number of down rounds that we might see over the next 12 months, um, whether in AI or even more broadly looking at infrastructure? Yeah. So if, if you look at the current environment, you know, 2023 is probably not an ideal time to fundraise. Most of the founders that we engage with are really focused on thinking about raising in 2024 and 2025, where we expect that their revenues will have grown in to uh, the valuations. But there will probably be some companies that will be in a position where they have to uh, raise um, uh, financing at a lower valuation than last time. Always a bit of pill. But a reality for many. Bain Capital Ventures partner Enrique Salem, great to have some time with you. Thank you so much. Bloomberg's Emma Palmer, we thank you so much for bringing the conversation. Meanwhile, coming up, what well, the Microsoft Activision deal moving forward means for big tech M&A in the future. And we're also talking about the future of the FTC with none other than William Kabasik, his former acting chair of the Federal Trade Commission. That's next. This is Bloomberg. We've got to get back to our top story, Microsoft's court win in the US to, of course, proceed with that $69 billion deal for Activision Blizzard. Let's get the FTC perspective. William Kovacic's with us. He is a former acting chair of the Federal Trade Commission, former member of the FTC, and currently professor of law at George Washington University. Professor, it's wonderful to have some time with you. What does Pleasure this mean here. for the FTC? They are taking big swings, but they seem to be missing. When they've taken swings based on theories that are a bit edgy, that involve using theories uh, about vertical acquisitions, such as Microsoft Activision, they're having a hard time in court. Uh, in short, they're having a difficult time expanding the frontier of enforcement to include theories that have been de-emphasized in the past. And this is going to give the tech community confidence that with certain types of transactions, especially if they're willing to offer concessions, which the parties did here, uh, that they have a fighting chance of prevailing when they get to court. And to that end, I mean, should the FTC sort of 
in a way be a little bit buoyed by the fact that they force such changes or indeed the worldwide competition authorities out there? If I were the FTC, I'd be claiming credit for the changes. I would say that if I hadn't been watching, if I hadn't intervened, the concessions would not have been given so directly and clearly. Uh, the judge in the case, in her opinion today, emphasized the clarity with which the commitments have been made. So I certainly do claim some credit for that. Without my intervention, those would not been, have been presented so clearly and so directly. What's so interesting is almost sort of five minutes apart of the headline that we understood that the U.S. court is sort of giving this blessing to Microsoft. We heard that the EU, it's reporting from the Financial Times, but the EU might well allow the VMware Broadcom deal to go through. What about some of these other deals coming down the pike? It's, it feels as though you think these could start to get through if they make these sorts of concessions. I'm thinking of Broadcom, VMware, Kroger, Albertsons and the like. If parties think very clearly and honestly at the beginning of the process about what the vulnerabilities will be, where the regulators are most likely to intervene and proceed to come up with solutions to address those, their prospects of success improve dramatically. Uh, the European Union, uh, the European uh, Competition Directorate has been quite willing to accept concessions. Uh, the courts in these US cases are willing to look at the suggested fix. This was the, tr the case in today in Microsoft Activision. It was the case for the administrative law judge in Illumina Grail. It's been the case in a couple of the, a couple of the challenges that the Department of Justice has brought. In short, what parties are having success with is coming to the court and saying, we concede that there might be competitive problems, but we have a solution. And just because the authorities are not willing to embrace them doesn't mean that you, judge, should not endorse them. That strategy has been effective. What then, when Lena Khan first came in, much was made, of course, of the work she'd done in st the study of the law around Amazon in particular. Many are waiting for what the FTC is going to do and bring in, in terms of the big one for Amazon in some way, shape or form. Does, does any of this perhaps arbiter an easier time for the big company, which of course we understand has been hiring a lot of ex-FTC people. I think the company is almost certain to be the subject of a complaint. The FTC has made so many commitments over the past couple of years that to not bring a monopolization case against Amazon would be seen as a fairly dramatic repeat uh, retreat. And indeed for the chair, uh, this has been held out as one of the main reasons she's at the agency. I think it does mean that the FTC is going to think perhaps a bit harder about how it assembles the proof that will make the case successful, because in these merger defeats, uh, what the courts have been saying is your evidence isn't good enough. And the last thing I think it does is that it probably gives Amazon more confidence that when the litigation process unfolds, that they're going to be able to meet the challenge. Uh, ultimately, as an enforcer, you gain credibility by winning. You don't have to win them all, but you have to win a critical mass of cases. And in Amazon, I think it's suggested if you're willing to mass all the resources that you need to take on the case, your prospects of success are going to be respectable. So I think that these defeats, in a sense, give them some, some confidence that they can prevail later on. Professor. Great to get your expertise on this. Thank you so much for joining us today. George Washington University law professor and former FTC member Bill Kovacic. We thank him. Now that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Look so much more throughout the day regarding tech. Look, Bloomberg TV's got a great exclusive coming up. 3.30 p.m. New York time with Citron research founder Andrew Left. Of course, he takes big swings in terms of thinking that share prices are going to fall. Meanwhile, don't forget to check out our podcast. You can find it on the terminal. You can look online on Apple, Spotify, iHeart. You want to be tuning in to all of the great conversations and analysis coming from our one Ed Ludlow out there in Sun Valley as well, as tech billionaires descend on Idaho. From New York, from Sun Valley, this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.